Hello, everyone. Welcome to week two of the ABCD Leptronym course. I'm Anakshi Khosla, and today I'll be talking about supervised machine learning for tabular data. So let's get started. Here are the learning objectives of this lecture. I'll first define the supervised machine learning problem, probably the most common type of problem in machine learning. Then I'll discuss the two main types of supervised learning problems, which include classification and regression. I'll then discuss the different supervised machine learning algorithms, including linear models and tree-based models. And finally, I'll talk about ensemble methods, which integrate multiple models to build better machine learning models. So let's first try to formalize the setup of supervised learning by talking about what we are given, that is, what's the input, and what we're trying to do. In supervised learning, we're trying to make predictions from data. We are given a set of data points. Specifically, we are given n pairs of points where x is the data and y is the outcome or the output we want to generate for the input data x. We call y the label and x the feature vector. Each training example, also known as a training instance, can thus be described by this input output pair. These data points are sampled from some unknown distribution P. And we assume we don't have access to this distribution. So we have to work with this finite data set D. We would like to take the sample data set D from this distribution P and learn a function H that goes from X to Y. So that's the goal of supervised learning. Let's consider the types of supervised learning problems and some real world examples. I'm just going to focus on some medical examples here, but really supervised learning is so big that it is useful in almost any field now. Prediction problems can be of many types, depending on what we want to predict. When the label or the target that we want to predict is binary, that is it can take only two discrete values, it is known as a binary classification problem. For example, let's say we are trying to build a model that predicts whether a given individual has dementia or not. You have two classes, yes or no. And so this is a binary classification problem. In classification, you might also want to distinguish between several different classes. For example, let's say you have images of skin cancer from several patients and you want to distinguish between the different types of skin cancer that an individual has. I think there are about four main types of skin cancer. So this is a multi-class classification problem. You have more than two classes. When the label you want to predict is continuous, this is known as a regression problem. For example, you might want to predict the degree of functional impairment caused by a disease in an individual. For example, you might want to predict some measure of motor decline in patients with Parkinson's disease or linguistic decline in patients with Alzheimer's. And you could have continuous measures for these impairments. So the next question is, do these cover all types of prediction perform problems in machine learning? Well, the answer is no. And there are other interesting supervised machine learning problems that don't fall within the above categories. For example, let's say that the output y is not just a discrete or a continuous valued scalar, but has more structure to it. For example, let's say you want to generate text from spoken sentences. The output, a sentence, has some structure to it. There are words and they are joined together in a particular manner. Similarly, there are problems where the output of your model are images, which have a spatial structure. Another problem is ordinal class prediction, where the label exists on an arbitrary scale, and what matters is the relative order between different values of the label. For example, let's say you're trying to predict the risk of developing dementia in an individual, and the categories you consider are low, medium, and high risk. And there are problems that arise when you try to treat the output values as a simple unordered set and perform classification with those values because you lose the ordering information. For example, you know that low risk is better than medium risk, but it, that's better than high risk. But for this lecture, we are just going to limit ourselves to simple classification and regression problems. Let's set up the supervised learning problem with an example here. Consider the case of dementia diagnosis. Let's say we are given this hypothetical demographic data set of a bunch of individuals in this tabular format, where the input can be represented in the form of a table, where each row is a single training example, and each column is a feature of the training set. You can contrast this with structured data, where input data has some complex structure or ordering to it, like images or text, which have a spatial and temporal structure, respectively. 
But for the purpose of this lecture, let's focus on tabular data. Coming back to this example, here are some demographic features that might be useful for predicting whether an individual has dementia or not. Just to illustrate the types of features you can encounter in any data set. We can have numerical features like age or years of education, which are continuous. We can also have categorical features like gender or smoking status, which indicate whether the individual currently smokes or not. These are examples of binary categorical features. You can also have categorical features beyond two classes, like for example, the ethnic category that an individual belongs to. To be able to use categorical features in a machine learning algorithms, we often need to convert them into numeric values. An often used technique for this is called one hot encoding, which involves binarization of every categorical label. Basically in one hot encoding, we remove the column of the categorical label and create a binary column for every label value that the categorical variable can take and enter values for the new columns. A one value is placed in the binary variable for the correct category and zero is placed for the other categories. So here's a simple illustration of the one hot encoding procedure. For example, in this data set, gender takes two values, male and female. So we create two columns, one for the male category and one for the female category. And a one is placed in the male column if the subject is male and zero is placed otherwise. So that the same procedure is followed for the other columns. Now the data matrix has all numeric values and we can use it for supervised learning. Let's discuss the basic workflow of supervised learning. So we have the training data that the learning algorithm uses to infer the relationship or the target function H that takes us from X to Y. Remember the training data comes in the form of pairs, features X, and the output y. This we give to the learning algorithm and the learning algorithm outputs a hypothesis h for what the function is. We can then apply this learned function to new test instances. For example, in this case, we can apply the learning algorithm to a new individual and we can make a prediction of whether the individual has dementia or not. And hopefully the prediction is going to match the actual label. In this case, the diagnosis of the new subject. And we want the learning algorithm to mostly get it right. Now let's discuss some common machine learning algorithms. We will start with linear regression. Then we'll discuss several variants of linear regression, which fall under the umbrella of regularized linear regression. Then we'll discuss two uh, popular classification algorithms, namely support vector machines and logistic regression. We're going to first consider supervised learning in the world of regression. Recall that in regression, the outputs of the label values are continuous valued. We first discuss the oldest and probably still one of the most important methods for regression known as linear regression. The assumption we make in linear regression is that our target function also known as the hypothesis H, is a linear function of the input features. So let's just assume we have multiple input features. Let's say we have B features. In this case, the model is expressed as the following. The output y, I, y hat i is a constant w naught plus w1 times the first feature value, for example, i, plus w2 times the value of the second feature, for example, i, and so on. The superscript notes the index of the feature, whether it's the first feature or the dth feature. So you can think of the superscript as indexing the columns of the tabular data matrix that I showed before. And the subscript i is indexing the training example or the rows of the data matrix. In words, our model is that the output is a weighted sum of the inputs. We can rewrite this in summation notation as shown here where the output is the summed value of every feature multiplied by the weight corresponding to that feature. We can also rewrite this in vector notation commonly used in linear algebra, where the output is the inner product of a D or D plus one dimensional weight vector, depending on whether there is a constant in the model or not, and the D dimensional feature vector Xi. We call these weights W as the parameters of this linear model. And the goal of the learning algorithm in linear regression is to figure out what the best parameters W are. 
So how do we learn these parameters from the training data set? Intuitively, we want to find parameters that make our prediction, denoted as y hat i, which are computed by applying the function h to the input xi, as close to the ground truth label yi as possible. To formalize this, we have to define a notion of closeness. This is captured by a cost function or loss function, which indicates how far off or incorrect we are in our predictions. In the case of regression, where we are predicting a continuous valued output, a popular cost function is the squared error. Here, you square the difference between the prediction and observed values for the label and sum it over all training examples. So now we've made this learning problem concrete. We want to find W that would minimize this cost function denoted as L subscript W. Note that we are given XIs and WIs in the training set, and we want to find the W that would minimize this loss function. Normally, when we want to minimize a function, we can do something like local hill climbing in the parameter space as shown here. So here, we start with random values for the parameter w. We compute the loss function for that parameter value and iteratively update the parameter values to minimize the loss function. This is a schematic of the procedure and is known as gradient descent. Gradient descent is an iterative optimization algorithm. It starts with a guess for the parameter values. Let's call them w superscript zero. It uses the gradient of the function value the function that you want to minimize, in this case, our loss at uh, w uh, superscript zero to generate a better guess. Let's call that w superscript one. This equation shows the update rule for computing the next best estimate of the parameters from our current estimate. Your alpha is a scalar that you have to set before and is known as the learning rate. So once you have w superscript one, then you can use the gradient computed at this new guess for parameter values to uh, find a better estimate still for the uh, weight uh, vector. And the process goes on and on for several iterations, and you stop until you're able to make much progress. And that happens when the gradient of the loss function becomes very small. This procedure would work for any loss function whose gradient we can compute. And it is a very popular technique for optimization in machine learning. There are several different versions of gradient descent also that are common. Often you don't use a constant scalar alpha, but you change it depending on the iteration you are at. So alpha depends on t in this case. Another common variant of gradient descent is what's called stochastic gradient descent. In this case, every iteration performs gradient descent on loss computed with one random example rather than over all of the training examples. Often it tends to be much faster because the loss is computed over a single example. Okay, so to find the best parameter values, one technique is to use gradient descent. But in linear regression, it turns out that the solution is much more elegant, where we don't have to do this iterative optimization Instead, we get a closed form solution. So how do we get to the solution? That is the W that would minimize our loss function. To do that, we have to refer to an important concept from calculus, which is the concept of stationary points or critical points. A point W is called a stationary point if the value of the gradient of that function at that point is zero. It turns out that if a function is convex, the stationary point is the global minima. So here, this figure shows the convexity of a single function. A function is convex if all values on the line segment between any two points stay above that function. So for the left figure, you can see it is convex. For this function on the right, the values on the line segment between these two points lie below the function. So it is non-convex. It turns out that the least squared loss function is convex. So the critical point is the w that's going to minimize our cost function. So to find this w, we have to compute the gradient of the cost function with respect to w. Let's try a simple change of notation. Let zi denote the difference between the observed label yi and the predicted value of the label w transpose xi for the instance i. We can construct a vector z for this value over all n training examples. <clears throat> 
This can be expressed in matrix notation as the following, where Y denotes the vector containing observed labels for all chaining examples. X is the input data matrix containing N rows or N chaining examples, each containing D features. And W is the parameter vector you want to learn. With this notation, the loss function can be expressed as the sum over all ZIs, which is the same as Z transpose Z in vectorial notation. Substituting the formula for Z above, we can write the loss function in terms of the matrix vectorial notations of X and W. To minimize the loss function, we set its derivative to zero. With linear algebraic manipulations, it can be shown that the gradient can be written in this form. I've linked a web resource that gives the proof for this here in case you are interested and not comfortable with matrix derivatives yet. Setting this derivative to zero gives us a closed form solution for the value of parameter w that minimizes our cost function. It is given as x transpose x inverse of x transpose y. So we saw the linear regression gives an elegant closed form solution. But there's a major limitation of linear regression models. Linear regression models tend to overfit when the number of features d in the data set is large. Recall that the number of parameters in your model, that is the dimensionality of W, is the same as the number of features in your model in linear regression. The model gets more and more parameters and consequently becomes more and more complex as you add more features. In the earlier lectures, you learned about the bias variance trade-off in machine learning and how this relates to model complexity. Complex models run into the risk of overfitting and have high variance, which causes them not to generalize very well to new test examples. Regularization is a general tool to address this complexity issue. It does this by adding a penalty on the complexity of the model in the loss function. A standard regularization strategy is L2 regression, which adds this penalty, sorry, this penalty to the loss function. And uh, this penalty is expressed as the sum of squared values of the parameters and is also known as the L2 norm of the vector W. The intuition is that these WJs represent the slope, that is they quantify how much a small change in the corresponding feature would have on the label Y. And you want these slopes to be small so that small changes in feature values don't produce a large effect on the label Y. The strength of this penalty is controlled by a regularization parameter lambda. Larger lambda puts larger penalty on W and thus favors simpler models. Even when using this loss function, we can solve for W that minimizes this cost function by again setting its gradient to zero. This again gives us a closed form solution for W shown in this equation. Note the difference from the standard linear regression. We just have this additional lambda i terms in the, in the formula for the parameter W. Linear regression with L2 regularization, which we just discussed, is a very popular regression algorithm and is also known as ridge regression. But it is not the only form of regularized linear regression. Other forms of regularization are also common within the linear regression framework. Another common regularization is L1 regularization, also known as lasso, where the additional penalty is the L1 norm of W, that is the sum of absolute values of the parameters Wj. An advantage of using the L1 norm is that it's like the L0 norm. So L0 norm of a vector computes the number of elements in the vector that are non-zero. But L0 norm is non-convex, so it's not easy to optimize. L1 strikes a nice balance in that like L2 norm, L1 norm is also convex, therefore easy to optimize. And like L0 norm, it encourages sparsity. That is, it encourages the parameters of W to be exactly zero. So in that sense, it also is implicitly doing feature selection because the features with parameter value zero have no effect in the regression model. However, unlike ridge regression, lasso does not have a closed form solution and requires iterative optimization. Another popular regularization is elastic net regularization which is a combination of L1 
and L2 regularization, each with its own regularization strength indicated by the parameters lambda 1 and lambda 2 here. It addresses one problem associated with L1 regularized regression, which is that L1 regularization does not yield a unique solution, whereas L2 uh, regularization does. So it combines the best of both worlds and encourages sparsity because of this L1 regularization term here, and admits a unique solution because of the L2 penalty here. It's also very fast like both L1 and L2 regression. So to wrap up linear regression, I also wanted to mention some important things. The name of the models say it's linear regression, but you can actually build non-linear models with linear regression. With linear regression. For example, if you want a quadratic form, you can create additional columns with pre-computed quadratic of the features in your model and include them as additional features in your regression model. Another important point is related to pre-processing. Whenever you have any regularization in your model, the scales of the features matter. So remember that in regularization, we penalize the magnitudes of the weights or parameters. And the value of the weight depends on the magnitude of the feature. So just to give you an example, let's say uh, the D features in our data set have roughly the same order of magnitude. Now let's say for just one particular feature, which can be expressed in arbitrary units, you multiply the value of every training example by 10 to the power minus three. In standard linear regression without any regularization, the weight or parameter values associated with that feature would have been increased by a factor of 10 to the power three. So now when we are penalizing the norm of the parameter vector, be it L1 or L2 norm, the norms are going to be heavily influenced by this one feature and practically all the other feature weights would be unaffected. To rectify this, it is common to standardize continuous value features before applying the machine learning algorithm. We compute the mean and standard deviation of every feature across all training examples. Then for every feature, we subtract the mean across samples and divide by the standard deviation across all training examples. And then we have to be careful with the test data. For test data, we should still use the mean and standard deviation computed over the training examples because the training and test statistics can be very different. And although not a requirement, it's also sometimes common to standardize the labels, YIs, to zero mean and unit standard deviation because this puts them on the same scale as the features. So far, we've talked about linear regression. Now let's move on to a classification problem. That is the case where our output, target or label, whatever you want to call it, is discrete valued. We'll focus on the case where the output label can just take two values. For example, the case of dementia diagnosis, where the individual either has dementia or doesn't. This is called a binary classification problem. Let's arbitrarily assign a target value of one to one class and minus one to another class. So, so example, a target value one indicates that the individual has dementia and minus one indicates that he doesn't. The first question is, can we simply use the regression models we discussed earlier in the classification setup to predict the target label? There can be several issues with this approach. First, linear models give us real numbers and our output label is discrete valued. So what if our linear model outputs a number like 0.5? What would that mean? Also, what would an output far greater than one or less than minus one mean? So let's revisit the linear model equation. In this model, we expressed our prediction y hat i as the linear weighted sum of the input features xi. Because this prediction can be any real valued number, we can say that during test time, we we'll round it to minus one or one, and then assign the label corresponding to this target value. So for example, if w transpose xi is 0.9, which rounds to one, we will say the predicted output is one. Similarly, if W transpose Xi is minus 50, as in this example here, which is closer to minus one, we will say the target value, the predicted target value is minus one. This prediction rule for Y hat is known as the sine function and, return, and it returns the sine of the continuous valued output W transpose Xi. So it seems like this could work. The next question is, 
should we just keep the squared error cost function and that we use in linear regression? But if you think about this closely, some issues will become evident. For example, let's say for one training example with an observed tar target value of minus one, we get W transpose X side to be minus 0.9. The error in this case is minus one minus minus 0.9 squared, which is 0 0.01. So the error is low and the prediction Y hat I, which is the sign of W transpose X I, is the same as the observed target value of minus one. So this is just what we want. We want the error to be low for correctly classified examples. So this is good. Let's consider another example. Let's say W transpose XI is minus 50 and the observed target value is again minus one. In this case, the error is upwards of 2000, even though our predicted target value, the sign of W transpose XI is the same as the observed target minus one. So our prediction was correct, but the error is very high. So it looks like the squared error cost function would not work. You might think, why not just use the negative of the classification accuracy as the cost function in this case? But the problem is that it is non-convex and not differentiable. So you cannot do a continuous optimization with accuracy. What do we want from a loss function in this case? We want the cost or the loss to be low if the prediction is correct. And if the prediction is incorrect, we want the loss to indicate how far off we are from the correct prediction. Okay. So now consider this loss function given by this formula, maximum of zero and minus yi w transpose times xi. If the prediction is correct, the sign of uh, w transpose xi is the same as yi. So yi w transpose xi is going to be positive and this whole thing is going to be negative. So the maximum of this function is going to be zero. So if the prediction is correct, the loss is zero. If the prediction is incorrect, the sign of W transpose XI is not the same as YI. And so this term on the right is going to be positive. So the light loss is going to be given by this uh, function right here. And the higher the value of W transpose XI, the far off we are from the target label and the more penalization we get. So that's good too. So in practice, we make a small tweak to this loss function and add a one here because the original loss function has a naive solution. A W with all zeros is going to return a zero loss. So optimizing this might just set all parameter values to zero. So we optimize this function instead, and this is known as the hinge loss. Support vector machines, which are one of the most popular classification algorithms, use this hinge loss with L2 regularization. So SVMs are popular for classification. Another standard algorithm for classification is logistic regression. Contrary to the name, it's a classification algorithm, not a regression algorithm. In SVMs, we map the linear continuous valued output W transpose XI to one or minus one using the sine function. What if we wanted the linearly weighted output to have a probabilistic interpretation, like the probability of the example I belonging to a binary class? This is called a probabilistic classifier. For this probabilistic classifier, let's say that the discrete values for the classes are zero and one instead of minus one and one. So know that minus one and one were arbitrary target values for the classes anyway. In SVMs, we wanted to go from W transpose XI to one or minus one, which was directly related to the target values. Now for this probabilistic interpretation, we want to map from W transpose XI to a value between zero and one, indicating the probability that the example belongs to a class. So if W transpose XI is highly positive, we will sort of assume that the sample belongs to class one with high probability. If W transpose XI is highly negative, we want to extend the interpretation that the sample belongs to the other class with high probability. And W transpose XI close to zero means that the sample belongs to the two classes with roughly equal probabilities. So the next question is, can we find a function that has the above properties? It turns out that one function that, that can be used for this kind of a mapping is the sigmoid function, which is shown in this plot on the right. So if W transpose XI is very large, it gets mapped onto the value of one. 
If it's very negative, it gets mapped on to zero. And the equation for a sigmoid is given by this function right here. So in this probabilistic model, this sigmoid gives us the probability that the example i belongs to class one. Using rules from probability, it can be shown that the probability that the example belongs to the other class is simply one minus this sigmoid, since we only have two classes. And at test time, we can assign the label that has a higher probability. Because this is a probabilistic model, in order to find the parameters w, we can try to maximize the probability of choosing the correct category. In practice, this is achieved by trying to minimize the negative log likelihood loss function, also known as the logistic loss, given by this equation right here. Intuitively, it can be seen that this loss function might work well. If the true label is one, and the probability that your example belongs to class one, h of xi is very high, close to one, you can see that both of these terms are going to be zero. So your error or loss is zero. Similarly, if your true label is zero and the predicted probability for, the, for class one is low, that is your prediction is correct again, you can verify that both terms are close to zero and you get a, about a close to zero loss. But in the cases that your prediction is incorrect, this loss function would result in a high positive value just as you would want. So just to quickly summarize, we talked about two classification algorithms, namely logistic regression and SVM. Both are very popular in machine learning. They achieve good prediction performance, are fast to train, and get the prediction out of at test time. Also, another advantage is that weights in these models have a very simplistic interpretation. They can be interpreted as the slope, that is how big or small an effect does a small change in one feature value have on the output label. And often they perform just as well as complex block, black block box classifiers like modern deep neural networks in the case of tabular data. In the case of neuroimaging data also, they tend to be just as powerful as these complex uninterpretable models. Next, we learn about decision trees. But before diving into the algorithm, let's define what a decision tree really is. A decision tree is just a form of displaying a function as a tree. Consider this simple and silly prediction problem. Now you want to classify whether a character from Harry Potter is good or evil. So good is indicated by a thumbs up label and evil is a thumbs down label. Let's also say we consider the following features for predicting whether the character is good or evil in the simplistic model. Namely, whether the character belongs to the Hogwarts house Slytherin, house Gryffindor, ignoring the other houses, the height of the character, and his or her gender. Here's an example of a decision tree associated with this data set. Remember that it's just a function and to get an output label from a tree, we simply have to traverse the tree and a label is given at the leaf of the tree. So at each node, we interrogate the features of a training sample to decide where we go next. For example, the first question here asks us if the character is a member of House Slytherin. Let's focus on the character Harry Potter, this row right here. Looking at the table, we see that the answer is no. So we go to the next node. This asks about the membership for House Gryffindor. Again, we see from the table that the answer is yes. So we go here. The next split asks about the gender and it's male. So we go right again. And finally, we have the height. Since height is 181, which is greater than 180, we go left and reach the end of the tree, also known as the leaf node. Every leaf node has a label associated with it. In this case, the label is a thumbs up or good. So we predict that Harry Potter is a good character. Similarly, you can traverse the tree for every example in this training set, and you can take a moment to convince yourself that every single example in this training set is classified correctly by this decision tree. So now let's predict the class membership of some test cases with this decision tree. 
The first character is Bellatrix Lestrange. She belongs to the house Slytherin, so we get our predicted label very quickly by following this path. A thumbs down or evil, which if you've seen Harry Potter, you might say is correct. So we just had to look at one feature value to get the answer. Let's follow another test case, Neville Longbottom. We start from the root node, which asks about the membership for House Slytherin, which is no. Then we go to the next node, House Gryffindor. Yes, we land here, which asks about the gender. Uh, looking at the label, we go here about the height. And comparing the height value obtained for this character against this uh, decision rule, we see that it's less than 180, so we go right here. And so the label we get for this character is a thumbs down or evil, which you might say is incorrect. Anyway, this is just to give you an idea of how to traverse a decision tree. Once you get to a leaf node of a decision tree, you get your decision or label right there. So decision trees are just functions. They comprise of the following components. They have internal nodes shown as ellipses in the tree, which test single features of the input. For example, this internal node tests for the height of the height, tests for the height of the character. Next component are the branches from an internal node, which indicate possible values of the feature being tested. In case of discrete value binary features, it is simply the category label name. But in case of continuous features, you ask whether the feature value is above or below a threshold in these branches. Finally, we have the leaf nodes, which are marked as thumbs up or thumbs down symbols in the decision tree. These nodes give the lab final label to the test input whose features correspond to the respective root to leaf node path. So we've looked at the main components of this tree. Let's go back to the example. Next question is how good is this tree? We build this long tree that gives us zero training error. And in practice, for any data set, we can build a very long tree that will give zero training error. But that is something that is not desirable. And the reason is because you might overfit to the training set. Remember that in week one, you cover the bias variance trade-off. If you split until every tra single training example is labeled correctly, and you have a large set of data points, then what you've done is that you've simply memorized your data set and built a very deep tree. In this case, you have a high variance model that might not generalize well to new data points. Instead, if you're willing to tolerate training error and you build a very small tree, that is the depth of the tree is low, then you can run in the, into the underfitting problem. That is the bias of your model will be high. So low depth means high bias and high depth means high variance. You ideally want uh, something that's in the middle. And it turns out that finding the optimal decision tree is a very hard problem. So in practice, we rely on a set of heuristics to find trees that strike this balance. So next question is how do you learn or grow a decision tree from training data? In decision trees, we use the training data to build a tree structure that iteratively divides the space into regions composed of data points with similar labels. Before considering decision trees, let's consider a decision stump, which is the building block of a decision tree. Stumps are simple decision trees with one splitting rule based on one feature value. So it's just one node of a decision tree. Or you can, and, or you could call, you can call it a decision tree of depth one. So this here is an example of a decision stump. How do we find the best rule for splitting? Note that one rule, for example, here, whether a Harry Potter character belongs to the, this Hogwarts house, completely defines the decision stump. So the rule consists of three things. The name of the feature you want to compare. Here, we chose the feature membership of House Slytherin. If the feature is binary, you can just go in two directions, either class one or class two. So for example, here the feature values was either yes or no. But if the feature is continuous, like height, you have to define a threshold. If the feature value is greater than some threshold, you go one way, let's say to the left of the tree. And if the feature value is above the threshold, you go the other way, to the right of the tree. 
Finally, you also have to define what label a test example will get when you go either left or right from the root node. Remember that you reach the leaf node after just one feature comparison in a decision stump. You can simply assign the most common label among chaining examples that land towards the left of the tree and examples that line, land towards the right of the tree. For example, you see what is the most common label among members of House Slytherin in the training set and assign the label here. Then you can compute the most common label among characters that don't belong to House Slytherin and assign the label here. And next question is, how do we find these three values so that our decision stump is optimal? That is, it gives the best classification accuracy it can. Well, you can enumerate all possible splits of features as the number of features in your data set is finite. You can try out different feature threshold combinations on your data set, and you can say you'll pick the split that maximizes a score. The score captures something like how well is the stump doing in terms of classification, and could be something like classification accuracy. What we want is that the prediction should improve after the split. At the root node, you have all the training examples. So the label any example will get at that stage is just the most common class label in your training set. After the split, you'll assign the more frequent label within each leaf node. And you want this to be more accurate because leaf nodes are supposed to be purer. That is more homogeneous in terms of the class membership than the root node. But there are several issues with using classification accuracy as a score of a decision tree. Note that decision stumps divide input space by horizontal or vertical lines because they just look at one feature and it can happen that no such line improves the accuracy. This problem persists in the case of decision trees which use sequences of splits to make a classification decision. It's common to find cases where some decision rules don't improve the accuracy, but they make classification easier at the next stage. So given these problems, a more common score in decision trees is information gain. It quantifies how much a splitting rule decreases the entropy or randomness of labels after the split. You can think of it as a measure of purity. That is, how easy is the classification at every stage? So far, we've talked about decision stumps, the building blocks of decision trees. Decision trees allow sequences of splits based on multiple features in the data set. So they consist of a sequence of decision rules. You could try out every possible sequence to find the decision tree, but it is computationally infeasible to do that unless you have very few features in your data set. So in practice, we follow a greedy approach. That is, we just restrict our view and find what's best at each step and go from there. So for example, we first find the decision stump with the best score. We split the data set into two nodes based on this stump rule. We fit a decision stump to each leaf's data and add the stumps to the tree that we're building. And we continue the splitting process until two conditions are met. Either the leaves are pure, that is all chaining examples within each set, within each leaf have the same label, or we've reached a user-defined maximum depth. So just some important things to keep in mind about decision trees, what they're good at. First, they are very interpretable. We know the decision rules at every step of a decision tree, so we know how the tree is making its decision. It's also fast to learn compared to other algorithms because of its greedy strategy. For test, test examples, you can also make the decisions very fast because you just have to traverse the tree. And depending on the test case, for some examples, you might just get away with looking at very few features. So in the example that I showed, if the house was Slytherin, you arrived at the decision pretty fast in just one step. Decision trees also do not require any pre-processing. So features can have different scales, magnitudes, or slopes. And they can also be a combination of discrete and continuous variables. So it works well with heterogeneous feature sets like gender, age, blood pressure, et cetera. In decision trees, you don't have to do any pre-processing at all. You're just splitting on single feature values, so the scales of features don't matter. 
Major cons are that the decision trees generally by themselves are not very high performing models. But it turns out there's a technique you can use to make them very powerful machine learning models, which we're going to cover next. And that technique is known as the ensemble approach. This approach very nicely corrects for the bias variance problems associated with the decision trees. Ensembling refers to the technique of combining multiple classifiers and regressors to improve the final prediction performance. The input to ensemble models are basically just classifiers. Why might we want to do this ensemble learning? It's because it works spectacularly well in practice. That is, it does much better than individual classifiers or regressors, and is actually quite easy to implement. Most winners in Kaga competitions use some sort of ensembling approach. There are two popular types of ensembling approaches. The first approach is called bagging. And an example of a popular bagging algorithm is random forests. We'll cover it next. Another popular ensemble technique is boosting. And a popular example is add a boost, which is a very elegant boosting algorithm. And we'll also talk about that. So let's talk about the bagging algorithm and its motivation. So in machine learning, you work with a finite data set. When you train a single classifier on this finite data set, you might have high variance because your classifier might capture things very specific to the sample data set, ones that are not very common in the original distribution that generated this finite data set, which could result in overfitting. One solution is to sample multiple data sets from this finite data set uniformly at random with replacement, also known as bootstrap sampling, and then training a classifier on each bootstrap sample. The final classifier is then the average of predictions generated by each individual classifier. This is roughly the idea of bagging, and it reduces variance. So it is much more effective for high variance classifiers. One example of high variance classifiers that we just discussed are deep decision trees. One popular instance of bagging is the random forest algorithm, which was invented by Leo Bryman along with bagging, and is a very popular machine learning model. You can think of random forests as bagged decision trees. So you bootstrap different samples from the training data set, and uh, you train single decision trees on each sample, but with a slight twist. Recall that in decision trees, you try out every possible split on every single feature. But what you do in random forests when training a decision tree is that you say that instead of trying all features, you randomly subsample k features and restrict the splits or your search to those subsample features. Remember that bagging or random forests is a way to combat overfitting. So you want very different classifiers to reap the maximum benefit of bagging. And restricting the search to a few number of features at a time in every split is one way of getting different classifiers and increasing the diversity. So they'll make very different mistakes. And the hope is that on average, these mistakes will cancel out. And it's been shown to be very effective in practice. Next, let's move on to boosting. It's a great way of turning the classifiers, that is models which have a high bias, into a strong high performing model. Unlike bagging, where the individual classifiers can all be chained in parallel, in boosting, we chain them sequentially. The idea is that in every subsequent training stage, we give higher weight to examples that were misclassified by our, our current classifier. While bagging reduces variance, boosting is a general way to combat or reduce bias. Here are the steps of the boosting algorithm. We start with assigning equal weight to all training examples. Then we first fit a simple, high, that is high bias classifier on the training data. Example, an example of a high bias classifier is a decision stump. We then assign weights to training examples. Misclassified examples get higher weights so that we try to get them right by the next classifier. We then refit the classifier on weighted training examples. And we go back and repeat this process for some M rounds. The final prediction is the weighted vote of individual classifier predictions, where weights reflect the accuracy of individual classifiers. Classifiers with higher weighted accuracy get more weight in the final decisions. 
and a boost is a common boosting algorithm. The algorithm follows the same general recipe of boosting that we laid out earlier. That is, we start with equal weights for all training examples. We fit a classifier to the training set with the current weights. We compute the weighted error of the model, and then we compute the weights of the classifier based on its error. We then compute the new weights for all of our training examples. And we form a strong classifier by weighing different individual classifiers according to their training error. I won't go into the reason behind adjusting classifier and training example weights with these equations in this uh, slide, but it turns out these formulae are well justified. And I've linked a resource here that you can check out if you're interested. So here's a quick summary of ensemble learning approaches. Bagging uses bootstrap sampling and reduces the variance. In bagging, we generate bootstrap samples from the finite training set, fit classifiers to each sample in parallel, and finally integrate predictions of all classifiers at test time by averaging. Boosting, on the other hand, reduces bias and turns weak classifiers into strong learners. It does this by training classifiers sequentially and by reweighting training data so that misclassified inputs get a higher weight for, feature, for, for training the subsequent learners. Final prediction in this case is not a uniform average across all predictions, but a weighted average. So that individual classifiers that were more accurate get a higher weight. That sums up uh, this lecture on supervised machine learning. Hopefully it was useful and thank you all for listening. I've linked some resources here in case you want to read up more on some of these topics covered in today's lecture. Thank you.